All right. Hey, Sarah, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. And my first question is, you know, you're the executive director at Next Level Church. You lead the executive team, uh, one of the fastest growing churches in America. You guys are doing incredible things that are impacting leaders all over the nation. Um, and so everyone sees that. But I'm curious, what, what about your leadership journey is there that you wish people knew uh, before you got to this point? What do you wish they knew about that journey? Uh that it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think in starting Next Level Church 15 years ago, it's, I remember driving, we have, we have this bridge uh, in, in Southwest Florida, it's the Cape Coral Bridge. So it takes you from Fort Myers to Cape Coral. And it's this beautiful view. When we first moved from <laughs> Indiana to Florida, I remember being on this bridge and so many times looking out on the water that was just gorgeous and saying, I love Florida. Like, I just love living here after looking at cornfields for a long time, you know, yeah. and, and uh, one, one night, uh, two, the night, I think it was either the night before or two nights before we started Next Level Church, uh, we were driving over the bridge and Matt said to me, he's like, when you close your eyes and you picture Next Level Church, what do you see? Mm -hmm. And I just remember like kind of doing that. We we're like crossing over this big bridge and I'm looking out and then I closed my eyes and then I looked up and I said, I see like 2000 people just worshiping and, and just having a great time. Like that's just what I see. And he's like, yeah, me too. And I said, how many people do you think are going to show up? We're getting ready to have church in a movie theater for the first time, you know, and we had 85 seats. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he's, I said, how many people do you think is going to show up? And he's like, I don't know, you know, and it just, you know, it's, I think the hardest part about, you know, having a dream and having a vision of what you want is being able to see it, but having no idea what it's going to take to get there, you know? And I think looking back in that moment, you know, 15 years ago, if I, if I could have told myself at that moment, like, just so you know, it's going to be about 10 years before you see that come to pass. And there's going to be a lot of hard days and a lot of hard years in between. I probably would have been like, I'm good. Turn around the car. Let's go home. And, uh, and yet just God's faithfulness every, every step of the way, you know, through that, uh, it's been a lot harder, um, but it's always been worth it. So I think I wish people would know that because I think, and I probably did this too, you know, you look on at people who are quote successful or, you know, who have arrived to whatever destination you think, oh, I can see, I see that. And man, I wish, I wish we could be there. Or I think we could be that. And you're like, yeah, but it's going to, it's going to cost a lot more to actually get there. I don't think I was prepared for that. Um, it, at that time, but it's been a lot more about the journey every step of the way, uh, a lot less about the destination. Yeah. So can you, can you talk about what was hard about it? You talked about the, the price you had to pay. And uh, I think John Maxwell said, you know, everyone idolizes and wants the, the perks of leadership, but no one realizes the sacrifices involved. Uh, I know you guys talk a lot about the S curve and making the jump. What are some of those, those things that you had to do that were extremely hard to even get to where you are today? Um, I think probably some extremely hard things were failing a lot and <laughs> uh, not seeing failure as, as final or not seeing failure as, well, then it's time to just shut this thing down. Um, Dave Ramsey, uh, I heard Dave Ramsey say, when you look at successful people, you look at them and they're, they're standing on a mountain and you think, I want that. Um, but then he said, you don't realize what they're standing on is a pile of failures hmm. and they're just failures that you just kept getting up from. And when I heard him say that, I've never heard someone put words to how I feel about our journey. That is how I feel. There's been so many failures. We did a lot of things wrong. We were so naive. Um, we started our church with $9,200 and really not a clue of what in the world we were doing. I was and I and two college guys, one of them who still smoked. <laughs> and, uh, you 
you know, and here we are starting a church. Like, what are we thinking? What are we doing? And, um, and so we did a lot of things wrong, you know, but I think looking at every time we did something wrong and not saying, well, then surely we can't do this, but going, all right, we did that wrong. We failed um, and not giving up and just really looking at the failures and learning from it. That's painful. You know, it's a lot easier to get it right and to be like, woohoo, we did it. That was awesome. And um, I would just say that there were just a lot of failures along the way, but just this determination to not, to, to not give up. You know, there's just a lot of hard things, you know, um, you know, people letting us down, you know, thinking someone was going to take the whole journey with you and then realizing they couldn't and they're, they're not supposed to. And just, you know, fighting rejection and, you know, just a lot of that, I think, has just been that, that, that pile of, of pain in the journey. But, um, but really just looking on and just not giving up through it all, I guess. I think that's crazy. I'm just curious. So I was going to ask this later, but how do you, how do you deal with the painful parts of leadership like that? How do you guys actually process that and not just throw up your hands and just say, I'm done. I just, I can't take this anymore. I mean, does it ever get easier? Uh, or is it just something you have to continually process? You know, that's a great question, Doug. I think I actually, the pain isn't easier, but learning to deal with the pain is easier. So um, I expect it now. I don't think I expected it when I first started in leadership. Um, I, I think I expected to maybe go through a couple of painful things and then you get past it. And I think I've come to learn that that's just not the life we're living. Uh, we're living a life that is actually full of pain and full of trouble and full of heartache. Uh, but it's so worth it to work through it. So on a practical side, um, I've, I've gotten much better at learning to deal with the pain. I didn't know how to deal with it early on. I think I grew up in a home um, where, uh, you know, it was never said, but it was definitely learned to just stuff your feelings and suck it up and move on. Um, and uh, things like, you got this, or fake it till you make it. And uh, those things I brought in with me into my leadership journey, and it did not work. And so learning to actually uh, face that pain, face uh, when someone hurts me or offends me, or when I feel let down, uh, to actually deal with it. So on a practical side, I've learned, I learned a lot about that. I mean, one thing is definitely... Um, that I have to process that pain. If, if there's an offense that comes in, because that's just what's gonna happen. Like, people don't mean to offend. Um, sometimes they do. Most of the time they don't. Uh, they've got their junk, I've got mine. We encounter each other, things happen, and offense comes. And you know, for a long time, I didn't really know how to process that. But I think I've learned a lot of, about offense. And so I think one of the major ways you know, that, that I've learned to deal with that is just looking at offense in a couple different ways. One of them is minor offenses and the other is major. And so the minor stuff, I just learned to let that stuff roll off my shoulders and not hold on to it and not, you know, uh, they said this in the meeting or they looked this certain way at me and now I'm offended by it. Or I think maybe something's wrong. Like, it's good. We're probably good. I know their heart. And uh, I'm just going to let some of that minor stuff go. Uh, but sometimes it's minor or sometimes I think it's minor, but then it doesn't go away. And then I realize, I actually think this is more major. And so really kind of learning to look at offense in a couple different ways, uh, minor offense and then major offense. And if it's major, then it has to be dealt with. I have to sit down. I have to have a harder conversation with that person. I have to have, I have to say, hey, when you said that to me, it hurt me. Or, um, you know, and, and I don't know if you meant it or not, but this is how I heard it. And being able to actually reconcile that offense so I can move on through that pain. Uh, you know, sometimes it's really not with a person. Sometimes it's not with someone you can even really sit down and talk with. So then I've had to learn how to process through that on my own, you know, just journaling and, uh, you know, and, and really spending a lot of time 
um, you know, just meditating. And for me, you know, in my, my walk with Christ and my, you know, in my faith journey, it's been a lot of taking it to God and asking him to heal those, those parts in me that are hurting so I can move on. Cause I think I've, I've just learned in leadership that when I walk around with that pain or I walk around with that offense, then I'm going to lead out of that. And that's not, that's nothing good that I want to pass on to people. And so I think just learning to process that pain and just to really expect it, you know, it's like, you think I, you know, I think again, early on in my journey, it's like, you look on, you think when they arrive at that place, then they've got it all together. And there's like, there's, it's like, there's some pinnacle of leadership that when you get there, then it's all taken care of. And that's just not true. I think I've just learned along the way, oh no, there's going to be different challenges different kinds of heartaches, different, I mean, when we first started the church, we didn't have any money. Like there was nothing. Uh, we drank Kool-Aid for a year. Uh, <laughs> my husband, I remember saying, hey, when it comes to the budget, there's no money for Coca-Cola. Like that was a big, you know, um, and so, you know, that's painful. Like that's a hard, you know, we had to sacrifice a lot of things. And, um, and so no, now there is provision. We don't have that kind of struggle. We just have a whole different struggle now. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I say a little bit about pain. I don't know if that helps. So. No, that's so good. And it leads into my next question. So I've observed this and Ben, my friend, as I was researching, you probably said it best. He said, you exemplify the statement, we care more about who you are um, than what you do. And I know from watching you, you guys lead in your church, uh, your culture is extremely important and the health of the leaders in your culture is extremely important to you. So I'm just, I just want to talk to you a few questions about culture. First, can you just talk about the culture you and Matt have tried to create at Next Level Church and, and how you do that and why? Well, first of all, let me say I'm honored that Ben would even say that about me. Um, <laughs> that's, that's actually very humbling. I, that, because that is my heart. And so, you know, for someone who's in an organization that actually encounters me to, to tell you that I'm living that out, that means a lot, so thank you. Um, I don't take that for granted. I think, you know, I think some people grow up in, grow up in leadership cultures or uh, happen onto leadership cultures that are healthy and good and vibrant, and they look on at those cultures and they're like, that's what we wanna create, you know? Um, to be honest, Matt and I just didn't have that. Uh, I grew up in, um, you know, in a, in a ministry setting. I was a, I was a uh, pastor's kid and, uh, and grew up in not just in our church, but then even just a greater organizational setting where um, wonderful people, uh, but there was, when it came to leadership, it, it was the opposite. It was definitely, we care a lot more about what you can do for us and for our ministry and for our uh, platform, whether it was ever said, those were just kind of the things that were implied uh, through the way they led. And so being the recipients of that for quite a few years left Matt and I empty as leaders, you know, left us feeling like, is this really all about you? Um, is this, or do you even care about me? Do you even, do you see me? Do you, do you know what God's put in me and do you even care? And so in beginning Next Level Church, we walked in with a lot of that pain and had to process through that. Uh, but we had just this feeling of, I think it can be different. Like, I think we can lead others in a way where they know we actually care about them. We care about the gifts that are in them. We care about the talents that they have. We care about their family. Uh, we, care about, uh, we care about their life. And yeah, we're doing this thing together, you know, called leadership and for us, you know, creating a church, but, um, but I really, really genuinely care about you. And so for us, that's why, you know, people are like, man, where did this come from? It's not because we read a book. It's not because uh, we were taught it. It's because we actually were taught the opposite and felt that sting and that pain and have just had this determination from early on we want to create uh, something different, something where people understand. So even, you know, it's just little small things early on, you know, saying to one of the guys who, you know, started the church with us, like, 
hey, we're here, we're gonna pour into you for no matter how long God has you here. If it's you know five months, if it's five years, if it's 10 years, uh, because we don't know what God has in store for you. Like we believe in you so much. And there was this one moment, I remember it was like, oh, probably four years in or something. And uh, he was like, you know, you can stop asking me what's next. Like, I'm here, I love it here. And for us, it was that feeling of, I know, but we just, we never want to hold on so tightly that you feel like it's all about what we're creating. We actually want you to know that deep down. And so, you know, I think it's important for people maybe to even just understand where that comes from, you know, because you can look on, you can read books and you can learn from others. That's great. We just learned the wrong way and just have this determination. The hardest part was that we didn't know how to do it at first. We had this... We, it has to be able to be different. We just didn't know how. So one of the one of the first things that we did early on in our leadership journey was we just said we are going to learn from everyone. We're going to be a sponge. Uh, we are going to soak it all in. Uh, you know, reading books and you know Matt was just brilliant at this early on. He was much more of a reader than I was. I always said, um, it's like, I call him, you know, people call him Cliff Notes. I call him Matt Notes. He would read a book and then he would just download all of the good stuff to me. And I'm like, this is amazing. Uh, he was a much faster reader. And, uh, and so, um, but we just became, we just devoured leadership, you know, John Maxwell books and Andy Stanley. And uh, when we couldn't afford it, we drove, uh, we drove to it. We, I, we sold multiple things to be able to drive to a conference in Atlanta called Catalyst. And uh, there's about 2000 people in a room and we were just so desperate to learn how to do it. And so um, I think that's, you know, one of the things is just desperation to want a culture that is like that, that is rich, that really, uh, that really cares about people. That's kind of the, the why that really drove us initially. Yeah, and so what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, if I'm a, a leader and I come on board an organization, my life could be an emotional wreck. How, you know, maybe I came from a background that you guys came from where I've never seen a healthy culture model. What do you guys do um, if I were to come in and make me healthy? Well, I think when we were smaller, it was easier. And I say smaller, meaning a staff of 10 or less. Um, it was actually a lot easier to not easier on a daily basis because you just have to keep having hard conversations but mm -hmm. um, easier for Matt and I as leaders because we could touch feel and um, and uh, personally invest in all of our staff and know that that personal investment in that staff was then going to uh, was going to then pour on to everyone else. So, you know, so if we're investing in 10 of our staff and, you know, pouring that in, uh, then, then they're going to turn around and pour it into the teams they lead. And, and so, um, so it was a lot easier it, in the earlier sense, you know, it looked like staff meetings, you know, weekly staff meetings where we were very intentional about uh, teaching something, sharing something. So never just working on the tactical side, but always working on the team side. How are we doing team? How is this going? Uh, really evaluating things when we encountered things that weren't good. You know, so here's, we're in this team meeting and this guy just has this horrible attitude. He's just sitting back and going, Oh, you know, or disengaged or negative or playing devil's advocate. And all of a sudden we're like looking on going, oh, that is not the culture we want. That's not what we're trying to create. Um, and pulling them aside, you know, hey, what's going on? What was your attitude in that meeting? Uh, how, you know, what, tell me what's going on in your life. Like, hey, you can't be like that. This is why, like you influence others. And, you know, and really dealing with that culture piece on a constant basis. Uh, it was a little, it, it was hard on a daily basis, but overall easier for Matt and I because we could touch, sense, feel all of it. Uh, it has gotten much more complicated as we've gotten past that. Uh, we're close to 50 staff now, and it has been, we got it wrong for a long time. I think, you know, Matt and I thought, oh, you know, uh, our heart will just kind of transfer down and it'll just kind of keep happening. And that is not true at all. And so the biggest thing that I think we've learned is we have to have the systems in place that reflect that same heart. You know, you can have this heart of, we care more about you than uh, what you do, 
but you have to figure out the systems that actually sustain that part uh, because if you don't then it's just going to get lost because not everyone has experienced what Matt and I have experienced. Not everyone has that same heart and that same DNA. And so, um, so probably one of the key things that we had to do uh, when our staff got bigger is put our leadership behavioral values in place and really look out because for a long time, we just, we, I don't know that we knew how to say what it was uh, that we were teaching people, we just were. Like it was just us, it was in us, it's just what we shared. Uh, but we didn't necessarily have anything written down, written on a wall, um, you know, we couldn't necessarily point to it. We could say a lot of things, um, you know, like, hey, we, you know, we want you to be vulnerable and authentic. So we could say those things, but we didn't have them written anywhere. Uh, it wasn't uh, evaluated. So that's actually what we've grown a lot into now that our staff has gotten bigger, is really figured out the systems for that heart to go forward. So we put our leadership behavioral values in place. We have seven of those, uh, like trust, we dare to be vulnerable, sacrifice, you know, we have an attitude that says we get to do this, um, you know, uh, fun. It, there's just, you know, we have a lot of different leadership behavioral values that we value. And what we had to do was sit down and say, what are all the things we value? You know, how do we behave and how do we want people uh, to act here? And, uh, and when we see them acting or behavior, behaving in a way that is in our heart, that is in our DNA, then we have to call them out on it. We have to say, hey, I feel like, uh, like you're not being vulnerable with me right now. You know, um, I feel like you're bottling stuff up. What's going on? You know, do you, do you trust me? Do you, you know, do you trust me as a leader with what's going on in your life? And uh, because, hey, around here, we trust. And that is one of our behavioral values. And like, it's big. So, um, so we teach it. Uh, we teach it on a monthly basis. It, right now in our uh, staff chapel, we teach one of those values. Uh, we'll sometimes do a whole teaching on it in our weekly staff meeting so that it can just keep getting into the culture. Uh, we also evaluate it. So that's actually what people are evaluated on in, in our reviews. So it's not, it doesn't have to feel like, well, I just feel, and I think you should, and people are like, I, I, what does that mean? Like, no, around here, we, you know, we sacrifice or we trust or we're teachable. And so, you know, teachability is one of our behavioral values. And if, if someone doesn't have that teachable spirit, if they're, if they are acting like they know everything, we can call them out on it. Hey, around here, we're teachable. So I feel like you're not being very teachable right now. I'm trying to share something with you and you're closed off. And so in our reviews, we can actually address that and people understand in that sense that we really do care more about you. Yeah, in our reviews, we're gonna look at the job, but that stuff should be getting done. We're gonna talk about that. Like if you're not getting the job done, you're probably not gonna be around here much, but we have to really look at how how you are and how we are together because I know that that's it's like the secret sauce. Patrick Lencioni, he talks about there's a smart side and there's a healthy side. And a lot of people like to focus on the smart side. It's easy. The smart side is actually a lot easier to deal with. What we're doing, how we're doing it, what we're creating. Uh, yeah, you need smart people to figure that stuff out. You need them to be talented. But the healthy side, it's the secret sauce. It's the sauce that makes people want to stay here. It's the sauce that makes the team actually worth, uh, worth working on. And so, so I think for us, th those are just kind of a few things that we do. Yeah, that's so good. I'm curious. So, Kander's certainly a part. You said you have no part. Well, maybe you have. No. My first question is, is Kander hard for you guys as caring as you are? And then two, how long do you stick with someone? So you said, hey, if they're not executing, they won't last long you know, the guy with the bad attitude. Can you just talk to leaders? How long do you stick with someone before you have to let go? You know, I know you guys believe in people. What have you learned about that and being candid? Um, that is a great question. I, candor was not easy for me to begin with. <laughs> um, uh, even harder for Matt. So Matt is, is uh, on Myers-Briggs, he's a strong feeler. And I'm actually a really strong thinker. So uh, Matt processes uh, problems and things that come up, uh, decision-making through how he feels and how other feel, 
others feel. I process through it logically. Uh, but both of us coming from those different veins uh, had different reasons why candor was hard. Um, I, for me, candor, for Matt, candor was hard because he was such a feeler that he was like, so I'm thinking and I'm feeling and I don't know, and, but maybe it's me. And then he's like, he would walk away and think, did I really tell them what I thought the problem was or did we just leave hugging each other, you know? Um, for me, it was actually hard because I was so logical that I would maybe approach things um, from such a logical standpoint that I've actually had to learn that there's, there is candor and there's the logic of, um, hey, you had a really bad attitude in that meeting, but I can't just be like, hey, you had a bad attitude. Uh, what's going on? Okay, that's like the logical side of approaching with candor. Um, I've had to learn to actually soften and know that there's probably something going on that's a little deeper, that's a little bit more. And so I still have to be candid with you. I have to say, hey, you had a bad attitude in that meeting. Did you notice that? Hear what they say, listen, um, and then know that there might be something deeper that's actually going on in their life. And so for me, I think the candor uh, has come because I actually do care about that person more than just what they're doing. If it's just about what they do, then if they have a bad attitude, but they're getting in and they're knocking it out of the park, then I'm not going to deal with an attitude because they're knocking it out of the park. But if they're knocking it out of the park and they have a bad attitude, then I know there's probably something going on in their heart and I need to help them with that. And I care more about them. And so I'm going to sit down and say, hey, you had a bad attitude. Not only is it affecting the team, but that has to be affecting you. What's going on? Something going on at home, something going on in your heart. And, uh, and I actually have to care about them uh, to, to actually approach that with candor. So I've had to, had, had to learn. I, I still hate hard conversations, hate them with a passion. Uh, you know, I still get sick to my stomach. Oh man, I know I've got to talk to them about this. I see this, I'm seeing this massive insecurity coming out in their leadership. I watched them lead that meeting and it was just not good. I know, uh, I know I need to talk to them about this, but I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so hard. I wanna throw up, I don't, I hate it. But I've seen the outcomes. Um, I've seen them cross lines, grow in their leadership, and I know it is my job to grow them. And so because I've seen the results, it makes the candor easier. If the result always came that it ended in a fight and, um, and it was horrible and uh, things got worse, well then no, I wouldn't wanna enter in those conversations, but I've actually seen it go well. So our goal is that when we see that there's a gap, we came to talk about the gap principle. So, you know, so the organization is growing and as the leaders of the organization, Matt and I, it's our job to keep growing too, but as we're growing, if the organization, do it this way, if the organization is growing at this rate, but a leader is not growing at the same rate. If a leader is not keeping up pace and there's a gap there, when it's back here, it's small. The gap's really, really small. And you're like, oh, that's just a little thing. It's no big deal. They kind of have a bad attitude or sometimes they deal with some insecurity and it's not a big deal. Probably true, not a big deal when the organization's smaller or there's less at stake. But as the organization grows or as they get put into a new place of leadership, and they're being required to grow, uh, that gap, if they're not growing, that gap's gonna widen. So instead of the gap back here being really small, now this gap, they're staying flatlined, sometimes even going down, this gap's gotten really, really wide. So our goal in having hard conversations and bringing light to these things is that they can just close that gap. And that's what happens most of the time. You have a small conversation, uh, you pull them aside after a meeting and say, hey, just real quick, wanted to kind of you know, show you this. Um, and, and they go, oh, thank you so much. Yes, I'm gonna cl close that gap. Next meeting, you don't see it, we're good. They've moved on. Um, but sometimes they don't close that gap. Sometimes that cap, gap just keeps getting wider and wider. And that requires a harder conversation. That's not just a, that's not just a here and there conversation. That's what we would call kind of like the ultimate hard conversation where we have to sit down with someone and actually say, hey, this isn't working. Yeah. Here are, and be very, very clear about the probably like five areas where it's not working. 
Uh, I continue to watch this uh, attitude that's not teachable. Uh, insecurities coming out. You've got a lot of pride there. And uh, here's how I'm seeing it affect those that you're leading. Here's how I'm seeing it affect you. And we've talked about this. We've had a lot of conversations about it and around it. But now this gap has gotten so big that if you don't close it, then you're not gonna be able to stay here. And then uh, we'll make it very, very clear in that moment what it is that we need to see in order for them to stay. And uh, we've seen it go both ways. Sometimes uh, those leaders can close that gap. Um, uh, sometimes they can close the gap enough, but even through that, we actually find that maybe the seat they're in is just wrong, you know? Maybe they've been over-promoted in a seat, or maybe it's just not their sweet spot. And so uh, sometimes kind of through that, we'll kind of go, maybe there's another seat on the bus, you know? Maybe it's not this seat, maybe the seat is wrong. So we'll try and do as much as we can to actually keep them on the bus. If they can close that gap in their, in their character and those things and start to close that up and show it up sometimes it's like hey that's all getting better but there's now there's still just this frustration in the job I think that's a competency thing I think maybe this just isn't the right seat for you so now we have a big enough organization when we were smaller it was kind of they didn't close the gap it was like there's not really a lot of other places to be or to go right now we've kind of got a lot of different areas and it's like hey maybe you just need a different seat and uh, and and then sometimes it, it does end in letting them go sometimes it does end in and um, at the end of the day, this just isn't working. And uh, lovingly uh, walking them out the door. You know, it's just, especially in the church, it's just different. Uh, it's just different than any other company or organization. Uh, because in a company, you're just like, you can walk them out the door and never see them again. In our church, most of these people, they're in our church, you know? They're still a part of our church. They're a part of our uh, church family. And so we lovingly walk them out the door of our organization, but we say, you're still in this family. You're still a part of, of the family. You, you can't be on the team right now, um, but you're still in the family. That's so good. Um, I'm sure there's a billion gaps we could talk about, but you mentioned insecurity twice. And it was funny, I was actually in a meeting with a bunch of leaders here. We were talking about a principle that um, Larry Bencourt learned from you guys, uh, where you encourage people to fall in love with the bus, not their seat on the bus. And I think that's like the greatest thing ever. But can you talk about the gap of insecurity and how, how you help leaders overcome that? And just out of curiosity, do you and Matt struggle with that? Or have you, and how did you overcome that gap yourselves? Or right. I think probably one of the only ways that we can help people overcome it is because we've had it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, both of us in different ways. I think um, for me, I dealt with a lot of insecurity. Um, honestly, not necessarily in um, in my competency and what I was what I was being asked to do uh, in some areas, um, but then I would find it in other areas. So, meaning this, you know, uh, I knew that I could lead a meeting, a run a project, get a team together, get that project going and, um, and accomplish it. Uh, but when I was asked to speak, oh no, 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 I don't speak. <laughs> well, what was that really? That was just a deep seated insecurity. That was just a fear of, uh, you know, of that. But, um, but no, 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 I don't speak. Like that's not what I do. So, you know, for me, uh, insecurity has definitely reared its ugly head in a lot of different ways. Uh, being a woman, uh, a woman in leadership, uh, leading other men, I've had to face insecurity. Um, uh, face insecurity of, uh, you know, of speaking, for sure, that was definite insecurity that I had to face. And, <coughs> and, uh, and really even just, and insecurity and being a leader in general. You know, I don't know that early on I ever just saw myself as a leader. I just thought, uh, I just thought I was a gifted doer. <laughs> and so, um, and so seeing myself as a leader and actually having to kind of fight through that insecurity was a big deal. So, um, so it is something that both Matt and I have struggled, uh, dealt with, overcome, and, you know, can rear its ugly head every now and then. And um, you have to keep overcoming it. But you know, I think, uh, I think we see it. Uh, I think, I think a lot of times in our organization, uh, we see insecurity and pride kind of go hand in hand. 
Um, a lot of times people will deal with insecurity and will either see insecurity result with this idea of I'm not good enough, I can't, I would never, um, and they're not actually able to rise up because of that insecurity. And so in that, we have to deal with that. Like, hey, you have a lack of confidence and being able to just speak into them, see what maybe they can't see and pull them up into that, uh, into that secure and confident place. Uh, that one is probably the easier one to deal with. Honestly, if someone has that insecurity, I can, hey, listen, you got this. I believe in you. I've seen this in you. They'll rise up to the occasion and go for it. And uh, once they have a couple of wins under their, bu their belt, a lot of that insecurity will just, will just go away. Uh, the harder thing that I've, I've seen uh, to, to deal with is when someone's dealing with pride that's actually rooted in insecurity. So uh, I, the only way that, that really we've been able to identify this is because this, was, this is exactly who I was. So in my leadership journey, I had a lot of insecurity about being a woman. I had a lot of insecurity about, um, about for me, just the uniqueness of being a pastor's wife, uh, but then also being a leader. Uh, there was a lot of insecurity and other people kind of put it on me sometimes too, like, oh, you're just in this seat because you're Matt's wife or, uh, you know, you're just, uh, you, you know, I guess I have to listen to you uh, because you're the pastor's wife or things like that. So it would wear on me, you know, and it would make me feel insecure. Like maybe they're right. Maybe this, maybe I don't have the skill. Maybe I shouldn't. Um, and so that would lead to insecurity. I actually listened to those voices or believed it, you know. Um, I had insecurity that was in me from, you know, from things in, uh, in just growing up in a ministry situation where there weren't a lot of empowered women. And so it, women who spoke or women who could lead in their own authority. So I carried a lot of that insecurity in. I just didn't know it was there. I mean, it would just rear its ugly head in a lot of different ways. Uh, like Matt would say, hey, you should speak on this or you should lead this. And I would just be like, no, I really don't. You know, well, I didn't realize that that was like a deeper insecurity in me. Um, but the harder one is pride. and what happens over time is if if you have that insecurity and you don't deal with it but instead you kind of just let it go there's that gap of insecurity and what can happen is you actually learn to function um, and be successful and you don't deal with insecurity and you go oh um I guess I am good at this. Like, oh, look at me. Uh, look at what I just did. I just went and, you know, led this whole thing. So this is exactly what happened to me in 2011. Uh, I was, you know, I probably had a lot of insecurity in me. I just didn't really know it was there. And so I was functioning out of a place of insecurity, but I had a lot of gifts and talents and abilities. And so in 2010, uh, we were getting ready to go from the high school, a portable location. We had been portable for, with our church for nine years. And so we were getting ready for it's kind of like this massive monumental moment in our organization, in our church life. And the massive monumental moment was going from being portable to being permanent and so Matt said um, babe if we're gonna get out of our uh, out of this project what we know we want it to be then I want you to head it up and what what the project was was taking over uh, a, uh, a facility that needed renovated uh, remodeled added to I've never done a construction project I've never done anything like this but he knew he could see in me I had the vision um, I knew knew I knew what this end product looked like um, I knew what it would feel like I knew uh, how to think through people flow and movement and work with uh, you know work with our uh, GC on that work with our designer and you know figure out the finances I had that gift and talent and ability to do all of that and uh, he was like you got this and I'm like are you sure I don't know and I've never dealt with and I have to lead a bunch of men and you know he's like you got this you know so I'm like great he didn't know I had deep-seated insecurity at that time right so I'm like awesome all right I've got this and uh, I will never forget kind of we had this goal like crazy audacious goal like could we be in by Easter which actually meant 
uh, that the project would only take about 17 weeks. And I'll never forget the general contractor, uh, he looked up, Matt said, I mean, is that possible? And the general contractor looked up knowing I was heading up basically every ultimate decision that had to be made. And that GC looked up and he said, it's possible if she doesn't slow us down. And in that moment, I was like, game on. Like, <laughs> I will not slow us down. I will function. I will, you know, I got this. And I ran myself ragged, worked 90 hours a week. Like, we got the whole thing done. And, you know, we moved in and our church doubled in nine months. You know, the whole thing was like, it's the, it's the what you always wanted. But that deep-seated insecurity that was in me was never dealt with. And what happened in that period of time was it was our ultimate uh, rival. It was the it was the thing where I looked on and went, "Look what I just did!" Like I I actually did that. And what happened was that place where I had been insecure actually got filled with pride, and uh, I needed to be humbled. And so in that moment of my leadership journey, it was the ugliest version of Sarah that you could ever have. Uh, I was. Um, I was filled with pride. I had a lot of things in my heart that were kind of like, um, that were just really ugly. That were things like, look what I did. I actually thought I did it, you know. Um, uh, when someone else would get accolades about something, I would have, of course I never said it out loud, I would have these ugly things that would go on inside like, hey, do they not know that I'm the one who taught that? Like, do that? And I mean, it was bad. It was bad. And, uh, and I think, you know, I had had that deep-seated insecurity that when I was successful, I just got filled with pride and, uh, and had to be dug out. So it's one of the harder things that when we see it in our team, it's harder to deal with because there's the pride and there's the, you know, somebody being uh, prideful about something or wanting accolades or wanting accolades information. Um, but then there's the deeper thing that might be going on, which is actually insecurity. And so, uh, so it's hard to deal with. Um, it's, uh, it was hard to deal with myself. Uh, but we have to just lovingly uh, walk people through that. And the only way we can walk them through is because we've been through it ourselves. That's so good. Um, we're going to go from there. There's so much good stuff. Uh, I, I would just say along the lines of character, you may have already answered this, so if you did, we can move on to the next question, but um, you guys lead with the focus of character over confidence. Um, I, I just wrote two questions. How do you look for cracks in people's character, and then how do you deal with those cracks, and how do you help people develop their character, not just their confidence? Um, I think it's probably just the, the cracks in the character. The way we do it is we finally teach we do this ourselves when we try and teach our supervisors and others to just look for the deeper thing that's probably going on um, so it's it's you're going to notice the little stuff and uh the little stuff it's you know it, it's little right and you think oh that's not a big deal that's just little but there's probably something deeper going on that's more of a character thing and so you know again it's uh we've got team offices so if there's someone on your team who, uh, you know, within the period of a week, three different times says out loud, oh, I just, I just, you know, feel overwhelmed. Or, you know, they're like, oh, I got this email from so-and-so and they're supposed to whatever. And they're just complaining out loud, right? Well, okay. Some of that, not a big deal. Every once in a while, we're going to have just that minor stuff that's like, yeah, I had a bad day or I just, you know, vented out loud. Okay. But you see that start to add up. You see that was three times this week. You know, that was out loud. They actually said someone else's name. Don't just blow that over. Understand like that's a little crack. Hey, what's going on? Like what's actually going on? You know, around here we have an attitude that says we get to do this. It kind of feels like you have an attitude that's saying I have to. Uh, what's going on there? And just really, um, again, most of the time it doesn't show up in the big stuff. Most of the time it shows up in the little stuff. And so you're like, I love your question because it's a crack. That's all it is, just a little crack. But if we let those little cracks go, then they're going to create these deeper gashes. And all of a sudden you're going to have a massive problem over here if you would have just shorted up along the way uh, and dealt with it. 
That's awesome. Uh, you talked a lot about being a woman in leadership. So the question that came to my mind when you're talking about that is if you guys decided, which I think would be sweet, to do an advance one day with, with all women leaders. And you're in the keynote, right? So you're in a room full of women, potential leaders, leaders. What do you say to them? I think one of the biggest things that I've learned about being a woman in leadership is that I have to not think about the fact that I'm a woman. <laughs> um, and that sounds, it might sound funny, but that was kind of like the big aha moment for me about four years ago. It was just this feeling of, why am I letting that hold me back? Like, what is it? And I just kind of had to go back and, you know, dig out just some things that had been spoken over me or things that I had heard or, you know, that are like, those aren't even true. Like, this isn't even, um, and uh, women can lead uh, just as well as men can. We lead differently uh, sometimes. Sometimes we lead better. <laughs> sometimes we lead uh, worse. Sometimes, uh, it, you know, it, but it does doesn't matter. So I would think, you know, probably one of the first things that I would say is there's a room full of women. And I don't want us to focus on the fact that we are all women here today. We are all incredible leaders that are gifted and talented. And I want us to rise up and be that confidently. So I think just kind of speaking that into women would probably be one of the first things I would say. Just don't think about the fact that you're a woman. <laughs> I love that. I love, love, love. Um... Okay, so it's been 45 minutes. I just want to jump into some fun questions, kind of just rush through them, and then we'll wrap up. Um, fun question, if you could go back to your 20-year-old self and have coffee with her, what would you tell her? <laughs> oh, my 20-year-old self. I would probably sit down and say, okay, sweetie, I need to tell you something really hard. Are you ready? <laughs> and she'd be like, probably not. I have no idea what you're going to say. And then I would say, you're more messed up than you think you are. <laughs> um, I had just carried a lot of things in from childhood, teenage years, and I think we all do. I tell my kids today, hey guys, just so you know, I'm probably screwing you up. I'm gonna go ahead and set aside a savings account for counseling that you're gonna need later for how I'm screwing you up because I'm an imperfect mom and I'm raising you and, uh, and I'm sure there are things that, uh, that you're gonna need to deal with coming out of you know, your childhood, right? Um, being 20, young in ministry, young in leadership, I would have just looked back at myself and said, you're more messed up than you think you are, and that's okay. Uh, and I probably would have told myself to get a good counselor and, uh, and dig some of that stuff out so that I could become the leader that uh, I was you know, called to become a little faster than I did. That's great. Um, I'll share a link of it, um, but I watched your talk that you gave at the NLLC event uh, called Serving His Dreams. It was phenomenal. And you talked about that season where you were working 90 hour weeks and kind of the outcome that that had on you. Um, you shared seven lessons. Can you just share one lesson you learned from that season? Maybe even give some context for, for how you had to learn. I know that was some difficult lessons you had to learn. Yeah, a lot of difficult lessons. Um, probably the biggest lesson I learned out of out of that entire season of time where I spent a lot I ended up spending 11 days in a hospital uh, flat on my back and um, coming out of it you know and going to counseling one of the things my counselor said was look at what God had to do now I don't believe you know, that God causes things so this is going to sound like that, but I actually don't believe that. I believe that God allows things and he works it together for your good. And so I can see that in my story now. But um, she said, look at what God had to do to get your attention. He almost had to kill you. And, um, <laughs> and I can laugh about it now, but at the time I was like, you're right. I almost died <laughs> because I wouldn't listen to myself or my body or how I actually felt. And um and I think that the biggest lesson I learned was that it's okay to be weak. And my weakness is what actually makes me strong. My vulnerability, my ability to not be okay, my, um, uh, my weakness is what actually gives me strength. And people can, people can learn from us if we're smart. They can learn from us if... Um, we're talented, uh, but they can connect with us through our weakness. And 
I had to learn that it was okay to be weak and it was okay to be vulnerable and it was okay to let people into just how messed up I was and it was okay to be messed up uh, because that's actually what would connect me to others as a leader, uh, as a mom, as a wife, um, and, uh, and yeah, weakness. I learned how to be weak. That's great. Um, back to more, more fun questions. Sorry, I forgot to include that one earlier. Um, what books do you find yourself giving away most often? If you give away, or if not, you know, what are the top three books you recommend? Um, ooh, I love, I love giving away books. Uh, top three books. Probably when I'm encountering the different categories. Uh, when I encounter, especially a woman in leadership, who uh, is trying to do the quote life balance thing. I think a lot of times women deal with that for whatever reason, a little bit more than men. The, how do I find balance? I need balance. Uh, I like to laugh and say, there's no such thing as balance. Uh, there's just uh, different opportunities and different seasons at different times. And so um, I, I love the book uh, by Christine Kane that says, uh, can I have it all and do it all, uh, please? And her, the whole concept uh, from this book is, yeah, you can have it all and do it all. You just can't have it all and do it all, all at the same time. <laughs> so I think, you know, a lot of times in our leadership culture today, we want everything now, fast, um, immediate. And so just the idea of it being a journey, I love that book. Um, I, love, I love anything Lisa Turkhurst has written. Uh, there's uh, multiple books and it's not necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily leadership books, but they're personal books that when you read them, you will become a better leader. Uh, I love her unglued book was probably a deal changer for me when I encounter someone who is uh, kind of locked up inside, which is how I was like, oh, I don't know how to deal with this. Um, like I can lead and I can do, but man, I um, I lead out of myself, I lead out of stress, I lead out of frustration, I give that, you know, and I put that on everyone. Uh, her book helped me a ton with that, it's called Unglued. It's all about how to remain calm <laughs> uh, in, uh, in even stressful situations. And so, uh, so that's a big one for me. Uh, probably a, just kind of a, a book that no matter what, uh, I always try and give men and women is uh, Shanti Feldman. Uh, this is a little bit more on the marriage side of things. Shanti Feldman wrote uh, two books called For Women Only and For Men Only. They were deal changer books for me and understanding uh, as, a, as a wife, but it's totally translated into leadership. Uh, the book For Women Only is all about getting into the inside of a man and how he thinks. And then For Men Only is getting inside of a woman and how she thinks and reacts. And it's uh, it, it's an amazing, they're amazing books that really help you because again, men and women, totally different uh, and really understanding. We always think everyone else is like us. So understanding how uh, others are totally different and how to respect that and how to, you know, I think for me as a woman, like just knowing that a man uh, has deep seated insecurity, but most of the time they don't want to let you in on that. Like that's been so important in my leadership to really understand that as a wife, I've had to understand it too, but for men only, for women only, those are just a few of them. Yeah. And the same question with podcasting. I'm assuming Matt, the Matt, <laughs> Matt's podcast is at the top of the list. For sure. Um, I have so many podcasts that I listen to. It's actually, I am an audible learner. I had to learn that about myself. I joked earlier about not being a reader. Uh, I had to kind of get over the fact that I do, I try and read about 10 paper books a year um, because it's just good discipline for me. But I am actually a really slow reader. I have a very hard time actually conceptualizing when I'm reading. I'm much more audible learner. So I have audible and, uh, and then I have podcasts and I listen in the car and listen while I get ready. And that's actually how, um, how I learn a lot. And so a uh, podcast, Andy Stanley leadership podcast is a must uh, for me. Craig Rochelle leadership podcast, um, uh, leadership momentum, which is Chris Brown. I really enjoy his podcast. That's from the Dave Ramsey uh, also, Entree Leadership, uh, love listening uh, to that podcast. So uh, those are um, 
trying to think if there's anything else. I'm probably later going to think, oh, why didn't I say that? But um, yeah, those are probably a few. I've actually dabbled in, um, I love Henry Cloud, and I've dabbled in his uh, new leadership podcast. It's got some cool, uh, just some cool concepts from, uh, from Henry too. So those are just a few. Yeah, best advice on working side by side with your husband for all of these years and staying married and keeping your family. Um, best advice is remember that the goal is to stay married and keep your family. <laughs> um, I mean, really, I can laugh, but it's true. I think that is probably, probably one of the things that I'm most proud of, um, in a, in a humbling way that God has brought me to this place where um, where it's true, you know, and, and knowing that we made a great team and we were supposed to work together, <laughs> we also knew it was going to bring a lot of challenges. And so, um, probably best advice has been, uh, to talk, 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 never stop talking, communicate, like we communicate like crazy. Um, and so, you know, when things, when a season changes, when something doesn't feel right, something isn't going right, talk about it. Just stop. Don't ever stop talking and communicating. Um, I think it's probably the biggest piece of advice for us now. I think the thing I'm most proud of now is being married 20 years, still, you know, working together, having two boys that for us love the church and love still uh love being with us and love being with the family i think uh just even keeping that at the forefront of our mind we could work hard we could create a church we could do all of this and totally lose our family and then it would be like nothing and so uh so really keeping that at the forefront of our mind is that our marriage is first you know our kids and um and the church and the work we do is is not first so yeah, that's so good. Um, I'll just leave this open to you, but uh, if someone's listening to this and they're saying, wow, this sounds awesome, I want to connect with Sarah or what they're doing in the church or leadership or learn more, um, where can people find you? And then what can we pray for you guys for and how can we serve what you're doing? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, my email um, is sarah at nextlevelchurch.com. So if uh, I have an amazing assistant whose name is Diane, and uh, we say of our executive assistants that they don't have their own job. Uh, we are two people doing one job. And so she can, uh, she can even help you with a lot uh, about me or things uh, that uh, we do in our organization. If you're even just like, hey, where do I get those behavioral core values? Like, you know, she can uh, get those for you. But um, uh, so, you know, that's just one of the ways. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. And uh, you can connect with me there as well. Uh, you know, I speak occasionally in our church and, you know, different, you know, different venues like that. But um, uh, we've got Advanced One Day. We just did our Advanced One Day. You mentioned that, you know, for business leaders. Uh, I did a talk on delegation there. And I think you can purchase that on the uh, advancedone.day.com website. So those are just a few of the ways. Very cool. Uh, last two questions. Sorry, you asked how you can pray. You asked how you can pray. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I, I just remember that I was like, oh wait, don't worry, I'm going to take you up on that. If that's maybe for us, um, here's here's what to pray for. There is way more vision right now uh, that God has given us than there are leaders and resources, and so uh, we are just praying and believing. Uh, our whole goal has just our whole goal in prayer from the very beginning of our church has just been God trustworthy. When you find us trustworthy with what you've given us, we believe you'll give us more. And so, uh, and so we, we are doing our part to be found trustworthy with as much as we know how. Um, and so we are believing that God is going to entrust us with more. And that means more leaders, more resources, so that the vision for Southwest Florida and impacting other leaders uh, around the, really the nation and the world uh, can continue to go forth. So that's what we can pray for. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you. And we will definitely be praying for you. Um, and then at the end of your life, what do you ultimately in your looking back want to be remembered for? Mm -hmm. 
I think that I would love, um, I would want to be remembered for the fact that I loved deeply. Mm. That I loved deeply. Um, that I knew how to receive God's love, um, how to um, love myself enough uh, to then turn around and love others deeply. If, if I can get to the end of my life and people will say that, and she, she loves, uh, then I think that will, that'll be success for me. Great. Anything else you want to, to leave leaders with today? Uh, no, I think, pro well, yeah, I'll say this. Just keep it up. Keep it up. Uh, probably doing better than you think you are. We're always harder on ourselves uh, than, uh, than probably we should be. So keep up the great work. Uh, keep learning about yourself. Keep putting yourself out there. Uh, try new things. Uh, try things that are that are potential failures for you, because that's how you're going to learn. That's how you're going to grow. Uh, if there's anything that you could give up today and have someone else uh, do for you, and you could teach and you could pour into them, do it. Stop doing it. You know, uh, look on and say, what is it that I am doing today that if I could pour into someone else and have them do it? Uh, then they could go further and faster and um, and just do it. Just just keep leading. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your time, Sarah. I really appreciate it.